Good morning, everyone. I'm Tony Bruni. I am a neuro-ophthalmologist and vestibular neurologist. I did my vestibular and ocular motor training under Dan Gold at Johns Hopkins. Um, as you are well aware from his preceding lectures, it was a great pleasure and a wonderful opportunity to have trained with him. And I'm honored that he and Jose have invited me to give this uh, presentation for you this morning on cerebral causes of vertigo. Um, so I've put together this little schema of a pyramid of vestibular understanding. So we're starting at the very bottom here as medical students and people just learning about taking the history and um, diagnosing patients with uh, dizziness complaints and there can often be early on in the uh, learning curve of treating dizzy patients, a focus on qualitative descriptions of symptoms, meaning um, a focus on, is this a true vertigo with a frank spinning sensation where we might be thinking it's a symptom caused by disorder of the vestibular system? Is it a lightheaded sensation or pre sensation where we might be thinking something more cardiogenic? Is it more of an imbalance or a sort of foggy feeling in the head where we're thinking that potentially this is something brain related? Um, and this can be very frustrating for any of us who have ever been stuck in this base of the pyramid. Uh, you can waste a lot of time here fighting with patients and trying to get them to describe their symptoms more accurately. Then we move up to the next level of the pyramid as we uh, gain a little bit more experience and we start to play the odds. And we'll see this in some experienced general practitioners and people who are providing emergent or urgent care. Um, and they'll do a screening examination, a like, general medical evaluation to make sure that there's nothing dangerous going on. And then they'll say, this is probably peripheral and send the patient home telling them that they should expect to get better. And if not to follow up as an outpatient and they're generally right. So uh, the vast majority of true dizziness, uh, true vertigo or other dizziness causes are benign but they aren't always and uh, cases can be missed using a, uh, a level of understanding that stops at the second level of the pyramid. So the third level is a little bit more advanced. And this is where we begin to see specialists like uh, otolaryngologists or neurologists. Um, and you know your own specialty, you know it very well and you're excellent at what you do. But there are these gray areas of overlap of symptomatology. So as a neurologist, you can see a patient and uh, do a neurologic exam and everything looks like it's going pretty well for the patient, except they have this persistent complaint of dizziness or um, some other potentially vestibular complaint. And you say, it must be your ears. I don't know. I don't know what this is, but it can't be the brain. The brain looks fine. We did an MRI. It looked okay. And I tapped on your reflexes. Everything looks fine. And so then you send them to the other specialty. So now they're going to the otolaryngologist with uh, the information that it's definitely not their brain, uh, but no one has told them yet exactly what the actual problem is. And then you get to the level of the neurotologist or vestibular neurologist. And here we are very bright. So we have an excellent understanding of the physiology of skew deviations and the VOR and canal planes. If you're um, a neurologist, you understand this ear anatomy and uh, the otolaryngologists have an excellent understanding of the eye movements that are uh, associated with different central and peripheral causes of dizziness. Um, and then we get to the topic that we're responsible for learning today, and that is vestibular disorders of the cerebrum. And there's maybe an additional level of nuance uh, that's required here. And um, this is less well understood. So unfortunately for the purposes of your entertainment and my presentation, we don't get lots of fun eye movement videos with beautiful schematics of localization like we've had in so many of the lectures so far. 
So the cutoff here between an expert level of understanding of vestibular disorders and then this gray area of gray matter in the cerebrum is the tentorium cerebelli. And unfortunately, I refer to myself often as a neurologist who's interested only in things that happen between your chin and your eyes. So I do very little uh, above there. I'm just kidding. Obviously, all of us who see dizzy patients know that there's a lot going on upstairs that we are taking care of all the time. So today we're going to discuss the, the relevant neurologic systems that can contribute to higher level, uh, le uh, higher, higher level vestibular disorders. We're going to discuss the basics of cerebral vestibular anatomy, and we're going to link uh, each of these significant anatomic structures, hopefully to clinically relevant examples of vestibular disorders. Some of these will be fairly common and some of them will be much less common. Um, but hopefully will give us a schema to work with as we move forward with a broader understanding of how uh, vestibular interactions can have such varied presentations. And in, um, as a part of this, we'll be discussing briefly some of the physiologic and pathologic sensory integration that's taking place uh, at different levels of the central nervous system. So one of the first things that we have to be aware of is that uh, at multiple levels, including very early on in vestibular pathways, there is convergence of different sensory systems. So by the time we reach cortical perception, so what the patient is experiencing, all of these sensory modalities have been sort of mixed up into a sensory stew. So I like to keep that in mind when I'm starting off at that base level, whenever I find myself really trying to pin a patient down and get them to just tell me what they're feeling already so that I can move on and get to the next set of questions. It's just not going to create, um, it's not their fault. So by the time they are feeling um, exactly what it is that they're feeling, it is no longer a clean uh, single sensory modality type of phenomenon. So that's part of the reason why I think patients are unable to reliably uh, describe their symptoms at times. And we know that that is true uh, based on some preceding work that's been done over the last many years. Um, and one reason why the titrate approach to diagnosing uh, acute dizziness or even chronic dizziness and vertigo um, can be so helpful. And this is a history taking method that really focuses on the timing of your symptoms. So what are the durations of symptoms? How often are they occurring? The triggers, or are they posturally related? Are they positionally related? Do they happen in particular environments or with certain dietary changes? Or are they caused by other things such as sound exposure or pressure changes? And then associated symptoms. So is there an auditory or oral predominance of associated symptoms such as in Meniere's disease? Or are there a lot of associated uh, focal neurologic symptoms where we might be th thinking something more like a brainstem or cerebellar TIA or stroke? So even at the level of the vestibular nuclei, there are already modulating inputs uh, converging at the, this level from both vision and proprioceptive inputs. So you have proprioceptive uh, fibers and senses coming, being transmitted from your feet and uh, from your spine, more importantly, to the uh, vestibular nuclei here. This is actually more pronounced in some lower mammals. So uh, studies have been done with head fixed positioning of rabbits and cats and you move the trunk around and you see uh, the eyes have a compensatory movement. Uh, but as one of my mentors from my neurology residency once said, we all have a little rabbit inside of us. Um, so, um, that's important, uh, particularly as people develop more pathologic states, you can see a, uh, a shift in the representation of uh, the spinal and proprioceptive effects on the people's sense of their dizziness or lack thereof. 
Also, vestibular nuclei are receiving feedback from um, the visual experience of the patients, and this will be modulating the VOR. And then as we move up into the, in the central nervous system to higher levels, uh, such as the thalamus as the next space station, and then eventually to the uh, vestibular cortex, we see that there is more and more interaction between all of these inputs. And by the time the uh, patient is experiencing their a nice little sensory stew, and we can wind up with some interesting disease states such as were discussed previously by Wu Choi in his uh, excellent migraine lecture. So in certain conditions, the I like to think of this as being a series of dials with different gains being put in from your cortical experience and you're just uh, your brain is constantly ratcheting one up or one down depending on what would be appropriate uh, for any particular scenario. And in some states, your uh, gain might be much too high for your vestibular sense. And all of a sudden, you're um, very sensitive to visual motion and becoming dizzy uh, with very little visual vestibular conflict. So one of the best examples of how vision and the vestibular system interact is unsurprisingly the VOR. The reason why it's not surprising is that VOR studies are, have always been a great way to develop an understanding of some of the uh, lower level physiology of the vestibular system. We like to think of it as a very precise system, uh, network that generates a one-to-one -one input output of head turn with a compensatory opposite eye movement to keep your eyes fixed on a target. However, this one-to-one -one has to be constantly changing. So um, one example is that viewing distance. So when you move from a viewing a far target to a near target uh, will have a significant effect on the amount of eye movement that must be generated for each particular head movement. An example that you can easily illustrate for yourself is if you put your thumb out in front of you and look at your thumb and you turn your head you will see that objects on the far wall are moving in the same direction as your head movement, meaning that you have uh, a VR gain that is larger than would be necessary for looking at that distant target and vice versa. If you look at the far wall you and you turn your head, you'll see that your thumb will move in the opposite direction, meaning that your VOR would be underpowered relatively if you were happen to be looking at that near target in the same sort of plane away from yourself. And because of this, it's, it's been quantified using head impulse testing. Um, we know that at near viewing, the VOR gain has to increase. Other situations where the VOR has to be manipulated uh, at a at a reflex level is with different uh, visual magnification. So if your visual world becomes larger um, because of uh, refractive changes, then the eye movements that are generated for each head movement have to become larger as well. And this has been studied when patients have been subjected to long-term magnified visual inputs and the VOR is then uh, restudied that the gains do increase, maybe not quite to the level of a 2.0 gain for doubled visual magnification, but uh, there is an increase correspondingly. And then in an even stranger um, scenario for, um, I can't even imagine being a subject in this study, but uh, some patients were placed under a condition of optically reversed uh, vision using a series uh, prism so that leftward moving objects appeared to moving right and vice versa. After a six hour period of being subjected to optically reversed vision, the VOR was almost completely suppressed in some patients. Um, after the removal of this visual disturbance, the VOR was unable to quickly reestablish normal gains. So one way, one place where this can be um, 
clinically relevant is when we're talking about magnifying or distorting visual uh, magnification. Um, the use of glasses, corrective spectacles, is the optics that are required to focus uh, images appropriately on the retina is under is minimizing or maximizing the image size slightly. Um, and in some patients, for example, uh, with progressive lenses, if they have an underlying dizziness disorder already, this may be a source of some of the additional difficulties that those patients have when they're trying um, to adjust to those types of spectacles and why often in our clinics, we have previously recommended that patients switch away from uh, multi-distance viewing lenses to single vision lenses. So I said before that we're not gonna get a lot of uh, fancy eye movement videos. So uh, you might be wondering how exactly are we gonna go about assessing some of these patients? What are some objective measures that we might have that would allow us to gain additional information about what the patient is experiencing and what the underlying uh, pathology or physiology might be? And one way that you can easily um, gain uh, some insight into higher order vestibular disorders is by assessing this uh, subjective visual vertical. Uh, one way uh, that this can be checked it, that is relatively easy and quick is with the bucket test. So the bucket test uh, involves taking a five gallon bucket as is uh, demonstrated here. And uh, there is a line that is drawn on the bottom of the bucket. Um, the exterior of the bucket, as you can see, has a corresponding version of the same line, um, along with a protractor that will give you information regarding the angle of deviation from true vertical and a plumb line, so a string with a weight or a washer attached to it to uh, give you true, uh, true gravity or, uh, orientation. So uh, the bucket is placed in front of the patient's head, as you can see in the picture B there in the lower right corner, and from each direction, uh, so the the provider, whoever's performing the test, will rotate the uh, bucket several degrees off axis in either direction. And then either the provider or the patient will slowly rotate the bucket back towards a, an upright position and stop whenever the patient uh, feels that that vertical line inside the bucket is vertical. And after several rotations from each direction, you take an average of those measurements and a normal patient will be within two and a half or three degrees of true vertical. And this can be disrupted in uh, multiple different conditions, and we'll discuss some of them and how they're relevant to cerebral disorders of the vestibular system moving forward. So um, we've talked about some of the higher level interactions that take place already at the level of the vestibular nuclei. And the next um, waypoint is, as would make sense, is the sensory relay station, the thalamus. Now, using uh, the nomenclature that everyone loves of the sensory relay station implies that there's a message that's just being handed off at the level of the thalamus. And that's not really true, particularly for thalamic or for vestibular signals. Um, as you can see here, just the inputs from the vestibular nuclei into the thalamus are quite complicated. It's why. I've always found the thalamus to be one of the more overwhelming structures to get a good grasp on as a neurologist, um, at least in any significant detail. But um, you, you don't really need to understand it in all these different pathways. But just to get uh, the idea that there's a lot of interacting signals taking place uh, from, the, especially with vestibular. Uh, signals. So these are being constantly modulated not only by other vestibular signals where uh, you might get um, otolithic and semicircular canal signals that are modulating one another or also um, visual signals or uh, somatosensory signals will be modulating vestibular signals as well. 
So what are some clinically relevant disorders of uh, thalamic um, origin? Well, one of the most obvious is going to be something called thalamic astasia, which is a disorder of balance with a tendency to fall, uh, often with lateral pulsion or retropulsion, meaning a tendency for the patient to push towards um, one particular direction or backwards. And um, this can is in absence of other thalamic symptoms, so particularly like hemisensory loss or weakness. And these patients may or may not have subjective visual vertical disturbances. When they do, it can be either controversive or ipsiversive, and it does not occur along with other features of the ocular tilt reaction. So they don't have any skew deviation or ocular roll. Um, as you can see in this friendly diagram here. So the um, thalamus and cortex, so where we're focused today, will have um, either one of them can have the red arrows, which is the subjective visual vertical disturbed in either direction uh, with a loss of balance or head tilt in either direction uh, when compared to that green line, which is true vertical. Another example that might be due to thalamic um, inputs being um, disturbed is PISA syndrome. So PISA syndrome is a disorder of lateral trunk flexion that is uh, more than 10 degrees when the patient is upright. When they're supine, this trunk posture resolves, uh, which does suggest that there is a graviceptive component to uh, this particular finding. Um, this is often or most often seen in patients with more advanced stages of Parkinson's disease, and it can be also induced by antipsychotic treatments. However, dopaminergic treatments can also cause it. So the treatment of Parkinson's itself can be responsible and often changing the Parkinson's treatment or changing the dose can be helpful. And anticholinergics can also cause this. Um, because the dopaminergic effects of Parkinson's medications can cause PISA syndrome, antipsychotics with some mild um, antidopaminergic effects can be not only causative, but they can also sometimes treat this condition. Uh, one reason why um, I said that it could be thalamic is that one theory is that this is as a disorder of the basal ganglia in Parkinson's, um, a, a D, uh, it is a loss of the uh, cholinergic inputs into the thalamus, which may accentuate some of um, the vestibular um, signals there. So um, SVV in these patients does tend to be abnormal and it tends to be in the direction of tilt. Um, there have been some cases of patients with PISA syndrome and unilateral vestibular loss reported. And in these cases, the patients tend to tilt towards the side of the vestibular weakness. There have been some studies showing that there is impairment of the uh, cervical vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. And these tend to be more bilateral than unilateral CVEMP loss. And um, this CVEMP loss was demonstrated to be more common in PISA syndrome patients than in Parkinson's disease patients or in healthy controls. Um, and this is one of those um, places where this abnormal graviceptive um, signal is res resulting in an alteration in the vestibulospinal reflexes that normally help to keep us upright. One of the difficulties with um, vestibular disorders and the relationship with some neurodegenerative disorders is that precise localization is going to be a little bit difficult. Uh, patients with uh, Parkinson's and other alpha-synucleinopathy um, related neurologic diseases 
will have decreased visual spatial performance even outside of the setting of pieces syndrome and there's a question of how much of this is due to more of um, a cognitive visual spatial representation which can be uh, particularly affecting uh, these pieces syndrome patients versus how much of this is a lower level thalamic basal ganglia interaction causing uh, this particular symptom. Uh, so we've moved past the thalamus now and we've worked our way up to the vestibular cortex. So the primary um, region that is uh, described most commonly as being the chief uh, area of the vestibular cortex is the parietal insular vestibular cortex. So this uh, cutaway on the right hand side uh, gives you a um, an idea of where the insula is in relationship to other brain structures and this the posterior uh, periinsular um, region in yellow uh, more superiorly and uh, some of the posterior lobule inferiorly um, have uh, multi-sensory vestibular um, sensory responsibility. However, there are more widespread regions, which we will see shortly, that also are multisensory and uh, vestibular cortex areas. So um, what do I mean by that? It's that so stimulation or abnormalities of those regions can result in either disturbed balance or in uh, true uh, vertigo or dizziness. So this region, the PIVC, the parietal insular vestibular cortex, responds mostly to semicircular canal signals, but um, all the, almost all of the neurons within this region that do respond to semicircular canal signals also respond in some degree to somatosensory and visual input. So it's the same nerve firing um, in response to both. Uh, to some degree. And because of that, it would be impossible for a patient to know uh, how to describe to you which signal it is that's causing them their problem. All right, so when we think about uh, significant brain and cortical injuries, one of the first things we always think about is stroke. So we've already discussed throughout this lecture series uh, the important findings related to localization of the acute vestibular syndrome and the ocular motor abnormalities that can be associated with that. So just um, quickly uh, to review the HINTS Plus series uh, set of bedside examination techniques is extremely sensitive and specific uh, for differentiating benign peripheral causes of acute vertigo from central and dangerous causes. This applies only to patients with acute, uh, the acute vestibular syndrome. So uh, the sudden onset of unprovoked dizziness lasting hours continuously with spontaneous nystagmus. However, the combination of an abnormal head impulse test, uh, a unidirectional nystagmus, the uh, no vertical misalignment, so no skew deviation on alternate cover and preserved hearing, is reassuring and allows you to know with a reasonable degree of certainty that this is in fact a vestibular peripheral vestibular disorder. When we get to patients who have more anterior circulation causes, so more uh, frontal, parietal, temporal lobe um, causes of dizziness, this is not going to be very helpful. And the reason why is that these patients in general do not have significant spontaneous nystagmus. Um, so this is where it's important to, in the emergency setting, also see patients walk um, without an evaluation of nystagmus or an evaluation of gait. Um, it is uh, very difficult to make any uh, very strong claims about whether a patient is having a dangerous cause of their dizziness or imbalance. And one of my uh, mentors, again, from residency used to say, make them walk, make them talk, and look in their eyes. And that was his screening neurologic examination. Um, 
the other thing to remember from the hints paper uh, that was, uh, I don't want to say overlooked, but that really stuck out to me was that severe trunchal ataxia was uh, very specific for central causes of dizziness. So if patients are unable to sit on the edge of the bed with their arms overhead or out in front of them, and they list to one side, that is very specific for a central cause of their symptoms. So it is interesting when we talk about vertigo being caused by these uh, middle cerebral artery strokes, because as a resident and a neurologist, seen lots of middle cerebral artery strokes. And I would say that for, um, I would say none of them in my experience has vertigo been a chief presenting complaint. Um, however, there have been several papers that have gone and looked at um, various collections of patients retrospectively and uh, looked at uh, the report of vertigo in these patients. And so um, we do have some information about them. There is there are patients who can report vertigo lasting minutes to days as part of usually larger, um, more typical middle cerebral artery stroke syndromes. Um, the Dietrich and Brandt paper listed here, they were able to find only 10 cases um, which involved strokes of the posterior insula or the insular, insular cortex as we had pointed out previously. Interestingly, and I'm not sure of the physiology of this, and perhaps this is a good uh, discussion point for afterwards, but seven out of these 10 patients had some form of nystagmus. Um, so two, of, uh, two out of two patients with parietal strokes causing vertigo, and three out of five patients with insular or retroinsular strokes had either gaze evoked or spontaneous nystagmus. Um, again, of these patients, only four of the 10 had other um, obvious lateralizing deficits such as aphasia or weakness or sensory loss. The subjective visual vertical can be disturbed in uh, strokes and other lesions of the vestibular cortex um, and sort of like the thalamic lesions, whether this is an ipsilateral or contralateral deviation is somewhat unpredictable. One other disorder that is important to keep in mind from a vestibular perception uh, perspective in hemispheric strokes is pusher syndrome. So this was uh, initially proposed as a syndrome that would occur with right hemispheric strokes. And this was um, supposed to be associated with contralesional subjective visual vertical and uh, also occur in the setting of spatial neglect. So I skipped a step there, but what is it? So pusher syndrome is a, a disorder in which hemiparetic patients will push with their stronger side. So the side ipsilateral to their stroke and they will push their body away from that side towards their weaker side. So they will continue to push themselves towards their weaker side in a tilting manner. And it is in the recovery and rehab phase, a great challenge and increases the risk of falls in a significant way. Um, the reason why I said that it was uh, originally proposed to have involved uh, subjective visual vertical disturbances and spatial neglect is that these um, three studies here have each shown that to a variable degree. So um, one will say that it, all three features are very commonly associated with one another. Um, another will say that there is no actual hemispheric predominance for a pusher syndrome. It happens equally in right and left hemispheric stroke patients, that there is no neglect association, that there is no SVV um, association. And then the other will say that it is predominantly right hemispheric and there is an association with spatial neglect, but there 
is not an SVV disturbance, but there is an SPV disturbance. So a disturbance of what is the subjective postural vertigo, uh, vertical rather than subjective visual vertical. Um, so this is just another thing to keep in mind um, as a, when we're talking about verticality perception and how it is represented in different brain diseases. Um, so along with stroke, the other thing that neurologists are always wondering about is seizures. So MRI and EEG for everyone. Um, but definitely there is a long history of reports of um, vertigo that is inducible by um, electrical cortical stimulation. And this has been reported with stimulation of the temporal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal parietal cortex, and then even in the occipital frontal or insular cortex. So again, as we had referred to when we were talking about the anatomy of the vestibular cortex, uh, there are many varied uh, and relatively widespread brain regions that are all um, receiving vestibular information and uh, can contribute to a patient's perception of vertigo. Uh, one, um, in patients with epilepsy, it is much more common that they will have temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, whether that is due to the significance of the temporal lobe in contributing to uh, vestibular perception, or whether this is just because the predominance of temporal lobe epilepsies very, uh, relative to other partial onset epileptic syndromes is unclear. Um, but when should you be worried about epilepsy as a cause of someone's episodic vertigo? So uh, patients with uh, epileptic vertigo tend to have a duration of their episodes of less than 30 seconds if their symptom is isolated either vertigo or dizziness, sort of a uh, more nonspecific uh, perception of um, self-motion or disorientation. However, the duration can be somewhat longer in patients who have more complex uh, seizure representations, which uh, may be associated with a uh, larger area of cortical spread and larger regions of brain involvement. Um, in children, it's probably more likely that um, cases of isolated and vertigo and dizziness are epileptic um, as compared to more complex semiologies in adults. And um, in looking back at the reported cases that have been well documented, the nystagmus is uh, rarely, um, rarely seen. Um, so one big clue that a patient might be having epilepsy as a cause of their vertigo is associated with more typical epileptic features. So if someone has an onset of vertigo along with um, hemi body convulsions or motor posturing, um, that would be a pretty um, easy uh, clue that there's something more going on here than um, a, a, some sort of peripheral vestibular disorder. Behavioral changes, so uh, speech arrest or staring episodes, loss of consciousness, um, 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 inappropriate emotionality, so that can be due to stimulation of the insular cortex as well. Um, nausea and vomiting is obviously going to be less specific, but diaphoresis and other autonomic features can be seen again from autonomic uh, from insular stimulation. And then other sensory features, such as hallucinations, whether auditory or visual, and some somatosensory hallucinations, such as a feeling of paresthesias and uh, a regional spread across a limb, um, all would be features associated with, the verti uh, with vertigo that would make you think that this was more uh, cortically related and could be epileptic. Um, interestingly, this was a case report that described, uh, again, a right beating nystagmus with a, a skew deviation in a case of left occipital lobe epilepsy. So um, the nystagmus is not entirely shocking given the um, uh, relative involvement of the occipital lobe in the pursuit eye movement system, but the uh, generation of a skew deviation is interesting from an anatomic perspective. <clears throat> 
So again, when we're talking about when do we keep this in mind, we have to think through the differential diagnosis of attacks lasting uh, usually seconds of isolated vertigo. And uh, one of the other things that will pop into mind when you're thinking that through is cases of vestibular paroxysmia. Um, so the question would be whether some patients or all patients with vestibular paroxysmia uh, should be evaluated with an EEG. Now, if you have the, the classic patient with vestibular paroxysmia who has 100 spells a day um, without any other seizure-like uh, presentations or symptoms, it's probably less likely that this is epileptic. Um, or, but in some patients who have relatively rare events and may not have evidence of neurovascular contact on their MRI, it might be worth keeping in mind. Um, the other thing that can look somewhat similar on the basis of having acute attacks of vertigo with perhaps a disturbed level of consciousness, staring spells, passing out, could be basilar migraine, uh, which is a migraine with at least two uh, features of aura that localize sort of to the uh, posterior fossa of the brain. So double vision, slurred speech, difficulty swallowing, loss of consciousness, uh, as I said, vertigo. And uh, one thing that's interesting when you're keeping uh, thinking of the differential of basilar migraine, vestibular paroxysmia, and epilepsy is that we do use anti-epileptic treatments for all three. Um, so in some cases, if we're not able to uh, establish a clear diagnosis, a trial of therapy might be appropriate. Um, other things that can cause brief attacks of dizziness, so uh, working through our titrate schema, BPPV and orthostatic hypertension would be either positional or postural, respectively, and SCDS, so superior semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome, uh, can also cause brief attacks of uh, vertigo, but is usually triggered by sound and pressure changes. All right, so continuing to talk about some higher level uh, vestibular disorders. So in, we've talked about balance and we've talked about vertigo so far, but these are some interesting illusions or phenomena that take place when there is disordered sensory integration. So one of the most interesting is something called room tilt illusion, where patients will experience br usually brief episodes lasting seconds to minutes, but sometimes lasting up to hours of, um, again, usually 180 degrees, but sometimes 90 degrees rotations of the visual scene within the role plane. Um, and this has been found to be uh, a phenomenon that can occur in patients with some peripheral vestibular disorders. So even in cases of vestibular neuritis or Meniere's disease, um, also in cases of uh, epileptic vertigo, some posterior circulation strokes, so brainstem strokes in particular, and there are also case reports of this occurring with uh, migraine or neurodegenerative diseases such as posterior cortical atrophy or the visual variant of Alzheimer's disease. And um, also in other more isolated cases of other brain diseases. Um, also, again, referring back to Wu Choi's uh, excellent migraine presentation, when we're talking about uh, chronic dizziness patients or uh, patients with vestibular migraine, there are abnormal responses to different sensory inputs. So um, in persistent postural perceptual dizziness, we have this uh, mental picture of the dials from my earlier slide where after a, an untrustworthy vestibular signal the dial from, um, for vestibular inputs is turned down so that your brain is not relying so much on uh, your signal of self-motion from your ears because you've had vestibular neuritis. And maybe to compensate for that, the dial for your vision, uh, reliance on vision gets cranked up a bit. 
And then as people recover, they wind up in this pathologic state where they're extremely uh, sensitive to uh, visual motion. So scrolling on screens, seeing action scenes or car chases on TV or riding in a car where there's no rotational movement, but the visual scene is flickering by or um, visually complicated environments such as grocery stores. Um, so we have that schematic in our head of the dials being turned, but we can also see that in fMRI studies. So um, the occipital lobe responses to visual motion are enhanced um, in patients with PPPD. And um, similarly, um, in vestibular migraine, uh, patients with vestibular migraine who undergo caloric testing will have um, abnormal um, metabolism um, compared to, I think this was a PET CT study that showed um, altered thalamic function uh, when during caloric irrigation when compared to normal patients. Um, one example of even higher order dizziness is, um, in, is actually investigated by this study, which discusses uh, the role of beliefs and perception in patients with motion sickness. So we've talked about different sensory um, modalities interacting, and this is a um, a study that looked at how your perception of your perception of your motion uh, can be uh, have an impact on how sick people feel. So what they did was they exposed people to the OKN portion of a um, rotary chair test. And during that, they had the patients um, continuously evaluating how much they felt that they were moving versus they felt that the drum was moving. And um, then afterwards had them uh, rate um, how certain they were that the chair was continuously moving or was not moving. And if there was a mismatch between their belief that perhaps the chair was moving, even though they thought that it definitely was moving, um, if they felt like it was, but thought maybe it wasn't, they were more likely to be sick. Um, so an interesting um, study to it was an interesting study designed to investigate that and perhaps is um, an area for uh, where we can be helpful in just describing to the patients why they are having the symptoms they are having and one of the reasons why um, maybe CBT um, can be helpful for some patients with chronic dizziness. All right, so that's We've worked our way up the pyramid of vestibular disorders, um, but now from the top down view, we're just looking at the tip of the pyramid. We see a dizzy patient with a relatively normal exam and we have a few options. We can just go back down the pyramid and we can play the odds or blame someone else. Uh, you can rely on their qualitative description of symptoms and just tell them I can help you if you can't help me, or we can reach for that. Uh, trusty bucket in the corner and see what information we can gain from that. Um, all right, that's all I have today. Uh, again, thank you to uh, Dan and Jose for putting together this wonderful program and giving me the opportunity to share this lecture with you. Um, and I'm sure we'll be opening this up for more discussion shortly. Thank you.